At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs 9. The Mayhar Temple Part 2 The lower floor was an enormous tank of clear water in which numerous hideous Mayhars swam lazily up and down. Artificial islands of granite rock dotted this artificial sea, and upon several of them I saw men and women like myself. What are the human beings doing here? I asked. Wait, and you shall see, replied Jar. They are to take a leading part in the ceremonies which will follow the advent of the Queen. You may be thankful that you are not upon the same side of the wall as they. Scarcely had he spoken when we heard a great fluttering of wings above, and a moment later a long procession of the frightful reptiles of Pellucidar winged slowly and majestically through the large central opening in the roof, and circled in stately manner about the temple. There were several Mayhars first, and then at least twenty awe-inspiring pterodactyls, thiptars they are called within Pellucidar. Behind these came the queen, flanked by other thiptars, as she had been when she entered the amphitheatre at Futra. Three times they wheeled about the interior of the oval chamber, to settle finally upon the damp, cold boulders that fringe the outer edge of the pool. In the centre of one side the largest rock was reserved for the queen, and here she took her place, surrounded by her terrible guard. All lay quiet for several minutes after settling to their places. One might have imagined them in silent prayer. The poor slaves upon the diminutive islands watched the horrid creatures with wide eyes. The men, for the most part, stood erect and stately with folded arms, awaiting their doom. But the women and children clung to one another, hiding behind their males. They are a noble-looking race, these cavemen of Pellucida, and if our progenitors were as they, the human race of the outer crust has deteriorated rather than improved with the march of ages. All they lack is opportunity. We have opportunity, and little else. Now the queen moved. She raised her ugly head, looking about. Then very slowly she crawled to the edge of her throne and slid noiselessly into the water. Up and down the long tank she swam, turning at the ends as you have seen captive seals turn in their tiny tanks, turning upon their backs and diving below the surface. Nearer and nearer to the island she came, until at last she remained at rest before the largest, which was directly opposite her throne. Raising her hideous head from the water, she fixed her great round eyes upon the slaves. They were fat and sleek, for they had been brought from a distant Mayhar city where human beings are kept in droves and bred and fattened, as we breed and fatten beef cattle. The queen fixed her gaze upon a plump young maiden, her victim tried to turn away, hiding her face in her hands and kneeling behind a woman. But the reptile with unblinking eyes stared on with such fixity that I could have sworn her vision penetrated the woman to reach the very centre of her brain. Slowly the reptile's head commenced to move to and fro, but the eyes never ceased to bore toward the frightened girl, and then the victim responded. She turned wide, fear-haunted eyes toward the Mayhar Queen, Slowly she rose to her feet, and then, as though dragged by some unseen power, she moved as one in a trance, straight toward the reptile, her glassy eyes fixed upon those of her captor. To the water's edge she came, nor did she even pause, but stepped into the shallows beside the little island. On she moved toward the Mayha, who now slowly retreated as though leading her victim on. The water rose to the girl's knees, and still she advanced, chained by that clammy eye. Now the water was at her waist, now her armpits. Her fellows upon the island looked on in horror, helpless to avert her doom, in which they saw a forecast of their own. The Mayha sank now till only the long upper bill and eyes were exposed above the surface of the water, and the girl had advanced until the end of that repulsive beak was but an inch or two from her face, her horror-filled eyes riveted upon those of the reptile. Now the water passed over the girl's mouth and nose, her eyes and forehead all that showed, yet still she walked on after the retreating Mayha. The queen's head slowly disappeared beneath the surface, and after it went the eyes of her victim. Only a slow ripple widened toward the shores to mark where the two vanished. For a time all was silence within the temple. The slaves were motionless in terror. The Mayhars watched the surface of the water for the reappearance of their queen. And presently, at one end of the tank, her head rose slowly into view. 
She was backing toward the surface, her eyes fixed before her as they had been when she dragged the helpless girl to her doom. And then, to my utter amazement, I saw the forehead and eyes of the maiden come slowly out of the depths, following the gaze of the reptile just as when she had disappeared beneath the surface. On and on came the girl until she stood in water that reached barely to her knees, and though she had been beneath the surface sufficient time to have drowned her thrice over, there was no indication, other than her dripping hair and glistening body, that she had been submerged at all. Again and again the queen led the girl into the depths and out again, until the uncanny weirdness of the thing got on my nerves, so that I could have leapt into the tank to the child's rescue had I not taken a firm hold of myself. Once they were below much longer than usual, and when they came to the surface I was horrified to see that one of the girl's arms was gone, gnawed completely off at the shoulder. But the poor thing gave no indication of realising pain, only the horror in her set eyes seemed intensified. The next time they appeared, the other arm was gone, and then part of the face. It was awful. The poor creatures on the islands awaited their fate, tried to cover their eyes with their hands to hide the fearful sight. But now I saw that they too were under the hypnotic spell of the reptiles, so that they could only crouch in terror, with their eyes fixed upon the terrible thing that was transpiring before them. Finally the queen was under much longer than ever before, and when she rose she came alone, and swam sleepily toward her boulder. The moment she mounted it seemed to be the signal for the other Mayhars to enter the tank, and then commenced upon a larger scale, a repetition of the uncanny performance through which the queen had led her victim. Only the women and children fell prey to the Mayhars, they being the weakest and most tender, and when they had satisfied their appetite for human flesh, some of them devouring two and three of the slaves, there were only a score of full-grown men left, and I thought for some reason that these were to be spared. But such was far from the case, for as the last Mayhar crawled to her rock, the Queen's Thipdars darted into the air, circled the temple once, and then, hissing like steam engines, swooped down upon the remaining slaves. There was no hypnotism here, just the plain, brutal ferocity of the beast of prey, tearing, rending, and gulping its meat. But at that it was less horrible than the uncanny method of the Mayhars. By the time the Thipdars had disposed of the last of the slaves, the Mayhars were all asleep upon their rocks, and a moment later the pterodactyls swung back to their posts beside the queen, and themselves dropped into slumber. I thought the Mayhars seldom, if ever, slept, I said to Jar. They do many things in this temple which they do not do elsewhere, he replied. The Mayhars of Futra are not supposed to eat human flesh, yet slaves are brought here by thousands, and almost always you will find Mayhars on hand to consume them. I imagine that they do not bring the Sagoths here because they are ashamed of the practice, which is supposed to obtain only among the least advanced of their race, but I would wager my canoe against a broken paddle that there is no Meha but eats human flesh whenever she can get it. Why should they object to eating human flesh, I asked, if it is true that they look upon us as lower animals? It is not because they consider us their equals that they are supposed to look with abhorrence upon those who eat our flesh, replied Jar. It is merely that we are warm-blooded animals. They would not think of eating the meat of a thag, which we consider such a delicacy, any more than I would think of eating a snake. As a matter of fact, it is difficult to explain just why this sentiment should exist among them. I wonder if they left a single victim, I remarked, leaning far out of the opening in the rocky wall to inspect the temple better. Directly below me the water lapped the very side of the wall, there being a break in the boulders at this point, as there was at several other places about the side of the temple. My hands were resting upon a small piece of granite, which formed a part of the wall, and all my weight upon it proved too much for it. It slipped, and I lunged forward. There was nothing to save myself, and I plunged head foremost into the water below. Fortunately, the tank was deep at this point, and I suffered no injury from the fall. But as I was rising to the surface, my mind filled with the horrors of my position, as I thought of the terrible doom which awaited me the moment the eyes of the reptiles fell upon the creature that had disturbed their slumber. As long as I could, I remained beneath the surface, swimming rapidly in the direction of the islands that I might prolong my life to the utmost. At last I was forced to rise for air, and as I cast a terrified glance in the direction of the Mayhars and the Thipdars, I was almost stunned to see that not a single one remained upon the rocks where I had last seen them, nor as I searched the temple with my eyes could I discern any within it. 
For a moment, I was puzzled to account for the thing, until I realised that the reptiles being deaf could not have been disturbed by the noise my body made when it hit the water, and that as there is no such thing as time within Pellucidar, there was no telling how long I had been beneath the surface. It was a difficult thing to attempt to figure out by earthly standards this matter of elapsed time, but when I set myself to it, I began to realise that I might have been submerged a second, or a month, or not at all. You have no conception of the strange contradictions and impossibilities which arise when all methods of measuring time as we know them upon earth are non-existent. I was about to congratulate myself upon the miracle which had saved me for the moment, when the memory of the hypnotic powers of the Mayhars filled me with apprehension, lest they be practising their uncanny art upon me, to the end that I merely imagined that I was alone in the temple. At the thought, cold sweat broke out upon me from every pore, and as I crawled from the water onto one of the tiny islands, I was trembling like a leaf. You cannot imagine the awful horror which even the simple thought of the repulsive Mayhars of Pellucidar induces in the human mind, and to feel that you are in their power that they are crawling slimy and abhorrent to drag you down beneath the waves and devour you. It is frightful. But they did not come, and at last I came to the conclusion that I was indeed alone within the temple. How long I should be alone was the next question to assail me, as I swam frantically about once more in search of a means to escape. Several times I called to Jar, but he must have left after I tumbled into the tank, for I received no response to my cries. Doubtless he had felt as certain of my doom when he saw me topple from our hiding place as I had, and lest he too should be discovered, had hastened from the temple and back to his village. I knew that there must be some entrance to the building beside the doorways in the roof, for it did not seem reasonable to believe that the thousands of slaves which were brought here to feed the Mayhars the human flesh they craved would all be carried through the air, and so I continued my search until at last it was rewarded by the discovery of several loose granite blocks in the masonry at one end of the temple. A little effort proved sufficient to dislodge enough of these stones to permit me to crawl through into the clearing, and a moment later I had scurried across the intervening space to the dense jungle beyond. Here I sank, panting and trembling upon the matted grass beneath the giant trees, for I felt that I had escaped from the grinning fangs of death out of the depths of my own grave. Whatever dangers lay hidden in this island jungle, there could be none so fearsome as those which I had just escaped. I knew that I could meet death bravely enough, if it but came in the form of some familiar beast or man, anything other than the hideous and uncanny Mayhars.